Is it lying to me? I'm not going to say no man watch of thee ever, hereafter, forevermore, because we don't want to pay no $700 for that. All righty. So we're live. Welcome, guys. It's a, it's a nice Wednesday night. Prior to the, um, uh, this may be Snowmageddon for us. Um, I heard people kind of jokingly say, you know, we get two inches, they call it Snowmageddon, but this might be Snowmageddon. Okay? Um, right now we're currently looking at a weather forecast, and they're, and they're kind of a, there's a range, but we're looking at forecasts anywhere from 9 to 20 inches of snow. So um, that's a lot of snow. I don't care where you are, okay? And um, uh, Joe, if you want to come by my house and shovel on Monday, I'll be glad for you to come by. Just, just saying, okay? Yeah, I know. I'm guessing you're not going to show up and do it, but you know, at least we we got that out there anyway. Okay. Um, and, and Dick, if you feel like coming down south and you know and shoveling, that's that's fine. You could always send clay over. Yeah, okay. All right. You what? Okay. Your ski do. Yeah. This is when you wish you had a snowmobile. Yeah. <laughs> All righty. <coughs> anyway, uh, praise the Lord. So let's get to Ephesians 6, verse 18. We're teaching on prayer and uh, praying always with all manner of prayer. And, I mean, with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit, watching there unto all perseverance and supplication for all saints. And as we have said, uh, alternate translations say praying always with all manner or all kinds of prayer. There's different types of prayer. And uh, we listed, and I'm not going to list them all tonight because we've listed, you have to go back and look at the previous ones. We've listed seven different ones. Uh, prayer of faith or the prayer of believing and receiving, the prayer of binding and loosing, prayer of um, consecration, dedication, the prayer of intercession, the prayer of supplication, the prayer of thanksgiving, prayer of worship, adoration, um, and praise. That's kind of one. And, um, and so we, we have those listed out there, uh, those different seven ones. We kind of categorize them as you know, prayers of the heart, um, prayers of authority, prayers of faith, uh, you know, kind of, you know, consolidate them. Uh, we, we had been doing the prayer of binding and loosing, which is an authority prayer. We're going to get into tonight the prayer of consecration and dedication, okay? So consecration, and I'm not going to write that out, okay? Basically, because I can't remember how to spell it right off the top of my head, so I'm just not going to spend all the time fighting that battle. Hallelujah. All right. Praise the Lord. Okay. So, um, there, you know, there's a lot of types of prayer in the Bible. We just talked about that. And kind of think of it this way. The prayer of consecration dedication becomes fundamental to all the other kinds because it is the prayer that deals with pride in our life, submitted to the will of God, submitted to the counsel of God, Submitted to the purpose of God. Okay, um, uh, there's a there's warnings throughout the Bible about you know being lifted up in pride. Uh, Satan's sin was pride. Um, God gave him oversight of you know uh, you know and covered him in diamonds and beryl and jasper and gold, and uh, he became prideful, began to assume more authority and power than he had been given. Okay, he became so powerful he thought he could overthrow God. Yeah, so. Uh, if you're going to be effective in prayer, uh, you have to be in a you have to be in a no pride zone. Okay? You can't be in a pride if you're going to be effective in prayer. Okay, you can't be lifted up in pride. You can't have pride. You just can't have it. All right? And see, people, like I said, you know, you can get over there where you get so prideful, you start taking more authority, you start, start believing for things that, that are outside the, the uh, parameters of the Word of God, outside of what God's Word promises you, that kind of thing. And so we've got to be careful about that. And one of the ways we stay careful, and, and listen, you know, when I say careful, we don't mean being full of care. We mean being watchful, being aware. All right? Um, um, it's to make sure that we're consecrated and dedicated to God. All right? James 4, 13 through 16 says, um, 
Come now, you who say, let's see here, so we're in James 4, 13 through 16. Okay? Come now, you who say, tomorrow or today or tomorrow we will go with such and such and spend, uh, spend the year there, buy and sell, make a profit, whereas you do not know what will happen tomorrow. For what is your life? It is a vapor that appears for a little time and then vanishes away. Instead, you ought to say, if the Lord wills, we shall live and do this or do that. But now you boast in your arrogance. All such boasting is evil. That's pretty heavy, isn't it? Now, see, this is where in the word of faith, charismatic circles, particularly our word of faith circles, we got so caught up in our authority and how powerful we were and we could just do this, we could speak that and get this. We needed to get into the no pride zone while we were doing it. Okay? We got arrogant. And there's still people who are arrogant. Think they can confess and decree things that the Bible doesn't promise. Okay? No. Here he says in that statement, in that, in the, here in James 4, and this is not the King James, obviously. Uh, he said, you ought to say, if the Lord wills. Now, what do we mean by that? If the Lord's wills, we will live and do this or do that. He's really saying, if you're consecrate and dedicate yourself to the will of God, all prayer, wherever we're coming from, every type of prayer, we have to be in a place that we're saying, what is God's will? What is God's will here? Okay? We need to ascertain that will and be submitted to that. Now, we you know, Dad Hagen wrote a book, and the title of the book was You Can Have What You Say. Now, when you read the book, it doesn't mean you can have anything that just comes up in your little brain. Okay? You can't have my wife. Because I will violate the Lord, uh, vengeance is mine, I will repay, say it, the Lord. My name will become Lord. I will repay. Okay? It's a joke. All right. Like the pastor I knew, I knew down in uh, eastern North Carolina, some guy hit up on his wife. The, the pastor's wife. Man's hitting up on the pastor's wife. He went to the Lord in prayer and said, that's all right, Lord, I got this one. You don't even have to bother with it. I got it. <laughs> yeah, he's going to take care of it, okay? Um, so you, you've, got, you've got to understand that we have to seek the Lord's will. And we have to say submitted to the Lord's will, you know? I mean, we get people who run off and they get into a prosperity seminar and they find out you know, they're going to give and they're going to, get, they're going to be rich overnight and they're going to have this and they're going to have, they can have And they start thinking of all these whims in their heart or in their soul, in, basically in their, their fleshliness. Of everything they're going to have because they got rich. Now, they're going to use God as the leverage for being able to go around and say, I'm giving to the man of God. I'm giving, you know, I gave, and I'm going to have supernatural debt cancellation and supernatural finances and all this, and then I'm going to go on a cruise for the rest of my life. And, you know, what's God's will for your prosperity? Now, we, we took it, and we went, you know, the Bible says, you know, it, God gives you the power to get wealth that he may establish his covenant in the earth. And then the other scripture that along that line says, and he gives you the power to get wealth and as no sorrow therewith. Okay? Now, James comes back and brings this kind of thought into it. You have not because you ask not, James 4, 7. Or you ask amiss that you may consume it upon your own lust. Now, we said this before, James 4, 7. Okay? Four, seven. And then Mark 11, um, 25, okay, 26, okay. James 4, 7 says, you ask not, all right, the word ask. And then they're here, he says, and, and um, Oh, sorry, 24. Because 24 he says, what things serve you desire when you pray. 25, 26 talks, okay. 24, when you pray. Now, very interesting. This word and prayer, pray, come from the same Greek word. Atia. Okay, they come from the same Greek word, exact same word. So when James says you have not because you ask not, or you pray not, or you ask amiss that you may consume. And then Mark uses the word pray, but it's the same Greek word. In the Greek, it's the same word. It's not a different word, okay? So asking and praying. We're talking about the same thing. We're asking, praying, asking, 
Okay? You have not because you ask not, or you ask amiss. So it was two sides to what James' statement was. It's because people aren't asking God. They're not even coming to God because we think that's humble. Or they get so arrogant they come and ask amiss. Finding that middle road is pretty hard sometimes. Okay? And, and when we're missing it, we're missing it both. We're, we're in the wrong ditch both times. When our humility is really a false humility, it's not humility. And then when we're asked, we get arrogant, we start asking amiss, that's wrong too. Okay? All right. So um, we have to be consecrated, dedicated. So our, we have to approach what's God's will. That's why what Brother Hagin always say, find scripture that covers what you're asking for. Because then you can find God's will. But when you're, just don't take some sermon that inspires you uh, and stirs you up, because many times some of that inspiration is simply feeding your flesh. We can't, that's why we have to say consecrated and dedicated. There are times that preachers are preaching the right message with the right spirit and the right anointing, but we are not here when we hear it. And pride enters in. We go into the pride zone. And where are we supposed to be? In the no pride zone. Okay? Pride enters in because we hear things. We go, whoo, I can have this, I can have that. You know, and you start, you're starting confessing all kinds of stuff. And what God's wanting to do is he to increase your wealth because there's need in the body of Christ around the world to preach the gospel. And all you're thinking about is how big of a house you can get on the French Riviera as your third vacation home. Hello. You know? Well, God don't care if I have millions of dollars. No, he doesn't. He does care where you're going to be where it's going to be available for use at. Okay? I mean, let's face it, if you if you won tomorrow the um a $1.5 billion North Carolina educational lottery, where would you be next week? And probably not that. Private question would be, where would you be in three months? Are you going to be, are you going to be in church? Are you going to be? And there would be nothing wrong with doing something fun, but God, God, if, if you won the lottery, God wants, God wants you to use that, would you use that money to reach people. You would need to, uh, even if you only got half of it, which is about what you get, somewhere in 40 to 50 percent you would actually get. So, 700 to 800 million dollars. Okay. You couldn't spend that if you tried in your lifetime. I mean, you could buy every, you could buy Lamborghinis, you could buy personal jets. I mean, you could, you're gonna have a hard time spending that kind of money. But where's where your heart? What are you thinking when you start thinking about having all this money? Okay? And that's, that's you know, so being, being in a position of consecration and dedication allows you to pray the other prayers more effectively. Okay? And in, and in, and in the heart of God and in the mind of God. Now, nobody's exempt from, the, from, the, from being challenged to fall into pride. Okay? Um, Deuteronomy 8, 11 through 14, and verses 17 through 18, uh, read this way. Um, I better write it down. Deuteronomy. Deuteronomy, Deuteronomy. Okay. So I said 11 through 14, and then 17 through 18, I believe. Okay. All right. Um, beware. 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 And that's kind of a, a shortened of be aware. Take the thought. Be conscious that you do not forget the Lord your God by not keeping his commandments, his judgments, and his statutes, which I command you this day. Lest when you have eaten and are full and have built beautiful houses and dwell in them, and when your herds and your flocks multiply, and your silver and your gold are multiplied, and all that you have is multiplied when your heart is lifted up 
you do not forget the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of bondage. Moving on to verse 7. Then you say in your heart, my power and my might and the might of my hand have gained me this wealth. And you shall remember the Lord your God, for it is he who gives you the power to get wealth, that he may establish the covenant which he swear to your fathers as it is this day. Notice the, the, the danger in, in prosperity. And having all this stuff is that you say in your heart, my power and my hand have gained me this wealth. That's forgetting God. And when you forget God, and a lot of times we do that without forgetting God. You know, I, I still come to church. You know. It's in the way we begin to pray. It becomes about me. It becomes solely about me it's about me having this and me having that and me this and me that and i prayed and got this you forgot god and god gets left out and the lord is a jealous god and he will not share his glory with any man or low man okay so one preacher said it this way. He said the prayer of consecration and dedication deals with pride in our life. And he, and he went on to say, I think of it this way, um, I, that the prayer of consecration is a prayer of commitment, and it's a pre-prayer to praying, uh, the other types of prayer. It's kind of a, uh, how many ever, you know, if you, if you ever did any college, community college or anything, and you were going to take a course, many times it would say, the prerequisite to this course is such and such. such. You know, uh, I remember when I went to East Carolina, <clears throat> we had to take the entrance exam and all that kind of stuff. And Math 1065 was freshman math. Okay? Well, if you didn't place high enough in the exam, you had to take Math 1062 um, and, uh, and 1063. You couldn't take 1063 because Math 1062 was a prerequisite. In other words, you had to do two semesters of math to make up the 1065 math. There I was. That's when you wish you listened. <laughs> In school, okay? That's, you know, when Mr. Denton was giving all that information out, you would kind of wish you were really zoned in with it, but you, you were thinking about, you know, um, how far you going to hit the ball in the ball game that afternoon, and you know, and who you who uh, baseball, and who you going to rack up on the football field that night? You weren't even thinking about math, okay? Okay, so so if you kind of look at it as a pre-prayer, you know, um, it should precede the other types of prayer. What does this mean? It means that we get our hearts right. They're submitted and yielded and pliable in the hands of God. So that as we enter in to the prayer of believing and receiving, prayer of faith, and we're beginning to ask and petition God for things, to receive God of God things, that He keeps our heart pure, and we don't ask amiss to consume it upon our lust. It brings us into a place where we, in prayer, are entering into a dialogue, not a drive through window order session where we go to God and you know Lord you know um, and we experienced this in our life one time you know we really want this house so I'm believing God for this house <clears throat> I didn't ask him what he thought I can have what I say see this, this is why this is here if we have that as a pre-prayer and we're consecrated and dedicated, even coming to something like the house, it's okay for you to want a house. It's okay to desire a nice home. But it, you still need to be submitted to him. Well, he would never say no. He might say not that one. And we get, I bind you, Satan, in Jesus' name. That's my house. <clears throat> we kind of went down that path one time. Um, we we had we had purchased our first home in 1992 ish um, in in, uh, in Greensboro, 
And, um, you know, we built our first home, and that, that all went smooth sailing. I mean, just, just, I mean, you couldn't have gotten either a better, easier path. We really couldn't have. I mean, just everything. And then in, um, about, let's see, oh, we've been in a house 19 years now, so good gracious. Good Lord. We bought the house in 89, I'm sorry, 89, because Shannon was, was uh, just born. Jane was pregnant with Shannon. So I forgot, but it, it was it was early on, and um, it was before ninety two. Ninety three. Anyway, we bought that house, and then about ninety eight, we started we started looking at a different home. We saw saw another home we wanted. Uh, we wanted to build a home. I actually, looked at the home we're in now, and at that time they had not painted the bricks. It was this pinky white blend with white, bright white lap siding up in some of the dormer upstairs. It clashed horrible. I mean, whoever picked that just didn't do a good job. They did it, it just the, 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 that that speckled brick with well, you know kind of pink undertones on the uh, on with a whitewash on it kind of look and bright white lap you know vinyl um, up on parcel upstairs because of the, you know just the way the house was built they couldn't brick that and so they did they went that route it, it was terrible kind of like the layout but we it was like, oh, that's horrible I hate that so we didn't you know. And, uh, and then we found at the at that time that price that house was fifty thousand dollars more. We paid for it later. And the, you know, it was it was at the asking price of fifty thousand dollars more than we ended up paying for it a year later. Okay, it's out in the market that long. So we kind of forgot that, forgot that neighborhood, forgot all about it. Went over to a different neighborhood, which was a nice neighborhood, but it was you know whatever. We kind of entered into a thing and started looking at home, and uh, it was it was more that what they call. Uh, they, they're not really track homes or spec homes, but they're 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 builders who have like three floor plans, and you know the whole neighborhood is is a rehash of the same floor plans, little changes on the outside here and there, that kind of you know, which is fine, okay, because we were going to buy that house, and as we went down that process, nothing went right. We couldn't couldn't we couldn't go out in the street with a with a machine gun and get people to come look at our other home to sell it. Couldn't get them in the door. We did everything. We jericho marched, March. We anointed. We threw oil everywhere. I mean, we did all the things you're supposed to do. You know, confessed, decreed, decried, declared. I mean, everything. They wouldn't show up and come anywhere near our house. Open houses, you know. Of course, the, Janelle was our realtor. And, you know, she was honest. She said, people have open houses to make the, the customer feel better. It doesn't do anything. You know, people just don't show up. And um, we, we went to Europe, and uh, while we were in Europe, um, the uh, time on our selling our home, see, we, sold, we signed with a contingency, time for us to get our house under contract passed. And so they were in the middle of construction on the new home, and they came and they changed everything. We had picked out certain color flooring, certain color countertops. We were having the house painted um, Back in that day, remember back in the late in the 80s and 90s, every home that was built by a builder was antique white with antique white trim. Now you may love antique white. I hate antique white. Personal, just don't like it. I don't like the yellow look to it. Some people like it because it doesn't show dirt. Whatever reason, I hate it. It looks like it's a, you know something's been laid out in the sun and yellowed on my personal taste level. If you've got antique white and you like it, I'm glad you do. I don't. And my wife doesn't like it. Okay? And so uh, they were going to paint the house white with um, white trim. And they were going to put two ounces of black per gallon in the white trim because it makes it look, how can put black in paint make it look whiter? It does. The contrast just snaps it off. Learned that from a painter. They told me, oh, yeah, just, just, put a little, just put B2 per gallon in. It, the white trim will look whiter, and boy, does it ever, okay? And um, so if you've got five gallons, just be 10, all right? And if, you need, if you need help multiplying, we'll go we'll get Janie, can help you at the church, she'll tutor you, okay? <clears throat> and um, so we had all the, you know, had, had these, the, the, the linoleum for the kitchen floor was a color, the countertops had a, had a color to them that they, they matched and coordinated together, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. We, had the, we did have white cabinets, but we were going to have a, a colored countertop and a colored floor. 
um, and so forth. Well, we came back from Europe and went to the house, and the doors were open, so we went in and walked in, and oh, and we would have flat ceilings. If you grew up, if you have popcorn ceilings, you know they're a pain to repair. They're a pain to get clean. You know, they, they're just a pain. I mean, they are. To clean a popcorn ceiling. And I grew up with them. And our house, the first house we built had popcorn ceilings. And, you know, we were happy with it. But I decided, you know, I wanted flat. Because I do things like step through ceilings. It happens with me. Okay, I'm in the attic, I step through. And it happens with Dick, apparently. Okay. Um, you know, and to patch that popcorn, you got to have somebody come in with a sprayer. You can't, you can't home do it right. So you got to have somebody come in and respray the ceiling. All right, it's about the only way to get it done right. I know this because I did it in my daddy's house. Step right through the ceiling. They were right over the top of the table where people were sitting and having coffee. There's a leg. <laughs> oh, yeah. <clears throat> he was not a happy man. He was, he was not a happy man. And uh, anyway, so we go in the house. And the ceilings are popcorn sprayed. The walls are antique white with antique trim. The floor in the kitchen is white. The cabinets are white. And the countertops are white. I expected to hear the ching and see a bald-headed guy with an earring and a, and a glistening tooth standing there. Mr. Clean. Oh, my goodness. Ruined the house. We're like, you know, and we had been praying at the other house. We had been praying and confessing and declaring that we're going to sell this house. <laughs> Went back to the, the, main, the office at the development the next morning and, they, and said, what did they do? We well, didn't sell your house at the time. Now, we still want to sell it to you. I said, forget it. Give me my money back. I ain't buying that. That's horrible. I, I didn't. I hadn't gotten in touch with my British side at that point, and I did not say horrid. If I'd done it back then, I would call it horrid, okay, because it was horrid. I mean, the kitchen was so white, you felt like you could lay somebody up on the counter and operate on them. But the whole time we were going through this process, I'm getting scratched on the inside, and I'm overriding it. I keep overriding it. Instead of going here first, I ran straight to, I believe that I receive and confess and declare and, de and, de and, de and decree it's mine. And, and he's scratching me. He's down here going, <laughs> I think a couple times he went, pow! I went, damn boy. <laughs> Let me get you a Big Mac. <laughs> you know? I mean, it's just, it's not happening. It's just not happening. Couldn't get it to happen. And so we're going through this whole thing, just going through it, going through it, going through it. And when that fell through, we were disappointed because we, we, we needed a bigger house. We wanted a bigger home. Jamie got pregnant with Nathan, you know, and we're trying to, you know, move on. And, you know, he's, he's coming along being Mr. Nathan, biting my foot. You know, he's, um, well, he, by, by the time we started selling the house, I guess he was about five, Okay. Uh, he would bite my foot when he was a little guy. He had the two teeth on top and the bottom. And he would be crawling. I'd try to stop him from going somewhere. I'd put my foot down. And he just went. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I almost kicked him across the, the, the two rooms. I mean, it's. <laughs> I look down these, these, you know, not holes, but there's these big indentures in my foot. Two sets of them. Oh, my goodness. And, um, you know, but the kids are outgrowing the home. They really are. And we needed, we needed more space. We, did, we desperately needed more space. And um, so we were disappointed. But we, did, we went back and said, okay, we're just going to fix this house up. So we, we painted and we put in new carpet and we did some, you know, put in some new linoleum and we did some touch-up and change-up and fix-up. And um, a year later, Janie was looking through a, a um, real estate magazine and saw the same home we had looked at the, that year before, a year and a half before, whatever it was, and that uh, they had painted all the brick white. And she said, honey, I like this. Didn't know until we got over there and drove over there, got to the house and realized it was the same home. 
but it looked so different. You wouldn't believe the difference it made. I mean, it was so different. And um, called someone, got, got in the house that afternoon, walked through it, and we just fell in love with it. This is the home, you know? And um, I really tried to get us to look at other homes, and we did. We went to other homes in the neighborhood, but that one was it. It's just we knew it was it. And see, by then, we had gotten to the, you know, Lord, we're, we're, we're not going to push this. We're not, we're, you, you lead us in, in, in our home purchase next time because we're not going through this again. And we just kind of settled to be happy where we were. And see, when, you're, when you can consecrate and dedicate and come to contentment, see, we're consecrated and dedicated to him and his will now. And we walked right into that home, and we knew. We didn't have to push it. We didn't have to shove it. They had reduced the price fifty thousand dollars. Well, actually, they had reduced it forty five, and we got them down another five. <laughs> okay, um, which was awesome. That's a lot of money. I mean, that's a whole lot of money. I don't care who you are. That's a lot of money. Fifty grand is fifty smackaroos. You know what I'm talking about? And um, so we started going through that process. And the only thing we dealt with in that process was the devil trying to stop us. But it wasn't the God that was trying to say no. That was when we were able to stand our ground in faith. And I'm telling you, we didn't have, we had a couple of people come through our home, but there was the other home that we had. But there's a, went out that one day and looked out the window, the front window, and um, there's a car sitting across the street with a lady sitting in the car turned off, and she's just sitting in there looking at the house. And we had run out of little flyers. We were for sale by owner. Ran out of the little flyers that were in the little tube box on the top of the thing. And um, I walked out there and I said, hi, how you doing? She said, well, I'm looking. I love, I love your home. She said, I ride through this neighborhood all the time. And I look at that house. And I've wanted, I just said, oh, Lord, I'd love to have that home. And fair enough, she's from Rocky Mount. Well, Rocky Mount's 45 miles from Greenville. And our house was an old farm. That house was a farmhouse. Had an eight-foot porch on the front all the way across and turned down the side with a six-foot porch. And so in the corner, this was a huge area. We had a table out there. We had birthday parties out there. I mean, it could be pouring down rain, and we just do all kinds of stuff out there. <coughs> um, Nathan had his own plate. I mean, he had a sandbox out there, a big one we built for one of his birthdays. We just left it there on the front porch. We had swing. We had ceiling fans. It was, for country folk, it was home. It was an Eastern Carolina farmhouse look. I mean, it was just, and she would just, it just reminded her of home so much. And she said, I just love this house. I said, she said, but you're, you're out of the little flyers. I said, you sit right here. Ran in the house. Honey, 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 where, where, where's, the, where's that flyer? Then, you know, I need to make a copy. They, that's who bought our home. Yeah, they, they bought our home. And they were so happy to buy it, so happy. And we, we got into our new home. But it was so much easier the second time. I didn't have to Jericho march. I didn't have to run out there and, you know, and shout and scream and throw oil all over the world and try to get somebody to buy that house so I could get the other house that I'm getting scratched about. Because after that event, we said, Lord, no more. We won't do that. We're not doing that again. We're going to follow you. And we're not moving in that, that kind of direction without a clear go from you. We had to have the clear from him in order to go that direction. And he gave us the go-ahead. And that, now, when we got the go-ahead, now, we've told the story before, and I know, we, oh, got time. I got plenty of time. I'm just warming up. Woo, I'm just warming up. Oh, yeah. For the longest sermon of your life. Anyway. Um. We moved out of our old home and into our new home as Hurricane Hugo was coming. Was it Hugo that, that came into Wilmington and flooded everything back in the late 90s? Hugo was coming in, whoever, Hugo, whatever, I think it was Hugo, you know, was des destroying Wilmington, flooding all of Eastern Carolina, all that kind of stuff. As it was coming in, the hurricane was going on, and uh, as it was going out, we were moving into the other house. We were in pouring down rain. 
I mean, we had to move everything into the garage. That house, the, the new house, had, had plastic everywhere. They had they put plastic on to keep the carpet from getting messed up during while it was being waited to be sold. So we all the house was covered in plastic, and the hardwood floors had had um, butcher taper all over it, taped down with painter's tape everywhere. And um, so I, you know, well, I'm, I'm over there moving in, and Janie calls me, honey. Sit down. What's wrong? Janelle just called. Okay. We had gone to closing. We had signed the contract, got the keys to our house, gave them the keys to our old house. And our, huh? Floyd. Floyd. Okay. Okay, Floyd. Thank you. I, I, one of those guys, Hugo or Floyd. Some of, some of these guy hurricanes are way better than the, you know, they, maybe they had to start calling him a canes. <laughs> uh, okay. Um, We had gone to closing, paperwork was signed, check was cut to the, go to the, um, from our amount we got out of our home, which was a significant amount because we'd been paying a lot, paying extra. Um, I, and they would give us, we, one of the things we had, we actually had to loan them money at closing because they didn't, um, they didn't know, they, they were $1,500 short at closing. And we loaned them the money. They paid, con the, uh, Realtor, I mean, the uh, lawyer wrote up a contract. You know, they, they paid the lawyer for 50 bucks to write up the contract, da 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 um, <coughs> they, they had to pay us back 90 days, okay? And, um, but we, one of the things we stipulated was we had, we got a day after closing to move out, okay? But they had gotten their key. We were moving out. We were loading the truck up. We were moving. And Janelle calls and says, Janie, are you sitting down? She said, no, Janelle, why? She said, sit down. This is on, it's like 6 o'clock in the afternoon. So banks are closed. Financial institutions are closed. Everything's closed. She said, I got a call. The mortgage company won't fund the loan for the buyer of your house. What idiots taking care of their business, you know? That's supposed to, supposed to be all taken care of before you ever show up at closing. That mortgage company ran a, a um, credit report on the couple after closing. And a bankruptcy showed up. An unpaid bankruptcy. And they refused to fund the loan. Now, I'm half moved in over at the other house. Unloading a truckload at that moment. People in the church are over there helping us. And we're rolling stuff out of the back of the truck into the garage and all that kind of stuff right then. And it's pouring down rain. I mean, rain's just coming down. And um, I get in the truck to drive back over because, you know, we said, what are we going to do? She said, well, we can't do anything until tomorrow. And, of course, the, 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 the wife had said, I paid that. And uh, she had to go, go, go diving, uh, record diving, trying to find the proof that she had paid that bankruptcy that didn't get, take, didn't get taken off the credit report. And so we're spending all night. It's pouring down rain. And, uh, you know, Jane says, what are we going to do? I said, we're going to move into our house in Jesus' name. I'm in the U-Haul truck driving back over. Jay, Satan, in the name of Jesus, you take your hands off my house. This is my house. You See, but what happened? See, we were consecrated and dedicated. We knew in our heart this was our home. And now I could stand in faith. It wasn't a Jericho march. I wasn't pushing buttons and pulling levers and trying to make something work. It was I knew that I knew that it was ours because God led us into it. We knew it was his will. We were standing on firm ground. And I'm, I'm, I put something on him. He probably had to go off and lick his wounds for a couple of days. So I, I put a hurting on him. It's my house. You can't have my house in Jesus' name. Well, the next morning, by, you know, by 9.30 or whatever, she found the paperwork overnight that proved they had paid it, faxed it over to the company, and they funded the loan. But I'm telling you, I'm like, well, you ain't getting my house, chump. I mean, if an angel had to go find it and stick it in her hand while she was looking, I don't care how it happened, 
It got found and got taken care of. But the point is, it wasn't like it was before when I was trying to make it happen. And I was getting scratched about you're going the wrong direction. I'm, I'm, there's a boldness, not an arrogance, but a boldness has come on me because I had the confidence that I know this is right. And it changes everything. So we, you know, and we're going to pick up here next week and cover some more of this. But when we are consecrated and dedicated to God and we get out of the pride zone, so we're in a no pride zone, and that's where we need to be. We need to be right here. All right? How great I am. How great I am. No, it's how great you are. How great thou art. You know? If you've got pajamas at home that say it's all about me, it's all about me, it's all about me, tear them up and throw them in the fireplace and use them for kindling. And you think I'm joking. My wife went on a chaperone trip to, for the eighth grade biology class at Shannon's grade to Wilmington when they were at Wesleyan, and one of the girls came walking out with her pajama pants on, and they said, it's all about me, it's all about me, it's all about me, it's all about me. They were pre-printed. They were pajamas made like that. And she thought, yeah, I know that. Everybody knows that. See, for us as believers, it's all about him. And it's all about following his will. Now, why didn't, why was God trying to tell me not to get the other house? Because he had something different and better for us. He wanted us, you see, his will was to give, get us that other home that ended up being way better than the, the one we were looking at. About 800 square feet more, um, laid out better. We had taken a bonus room and put an office in it, kind of chopped it up. It was going to be a small homeschool area. We ended up with a huge bonus room. It's now my, it's not, I don't have a man cave, okay? But it's, it's where I go watch TV. I got the 55 with the surround sound. My wife doesn't like surround sound. I don't get to use my surround sound in my bedroom often. <laughs> but the best surround sound in my house is in my bedroom. It's in the ceiling. And the, little, and, and there, and the, uh, and the tweeters, you, you can twist them and, and, and you, can, you can angle them down and then you can angle them in directions. And so they're aimed right to the middle of the bed. Okay, and then the center speaker, okay? Now, we got, we got one of those ceilings. You've seen them. Um, you know, it's, it's, you got, you got your, your ceiling, and then it goes up at an angle, and then it comes over, and then it comes down like that, and it's all the way around the room like that, square. Um, so we, right on the wall like this, our bed's over here on this side of the room, and we got a TV mounted right here, flat panel TV mounted up there. And I got surround sound in each corner and one in the middle, the same right at the, right at the bed, and it rocks. And you got the base cabinet in the floor. But that baby, I mean, you put you put Top Gun on, and the jet takes off, and you hear, <laughs> and Janie goes downstairs. Anyway, <laughs> I'm not there going, yeah. <clears throat> but we, the, but the, you know, and then the house ended up with um, there was a third floor walk up attic that we turned into a bedroom for Jessica. So Jessica Shannon, you had to go through, through the one bedroom to get up there, so we turned it into a suite. Shannon was downstairs, Jessica was upstairs, and so it was a girl's suite. Everybody got their own bedroom. It was a bigger house, it was a nice house, held value better, um, appreciated more. And, um, you know, God wanted, that's, God knew that was a better home for us. And we settled for the other neighborhood because we looked. At the price for the first one was higher, and the, the brick was ugly. But the price was really high. It was a whole lot higher than it ended up being. Because a year later, it came down. But my level of confidence and faith in the second round was completely different than the first round where it was pushing it. Because I'm the man of faith. I'm going to get this done. I'm going to John Wayne up on this one, baby. Let me tell you, partner. <laughs> You know, uh, to be a, such a tough guy, he has such a prissy walk. Think about, it. <laughs> you know, the do. Suddenly, the ability to stand in faith and to know that you're doing God's will, there's a confidence there that happens. And so this is why uh, we call this a pre-prayer. Be consecrated and dedicated. Stay out of pride. 
See, I'd be able to lift it up about you and how great you are and how great your faith is and you're so this and you're that. And you, you know, lest you say when everything is said and done, my hand hath gotten me this. All right? Let me tell you something. I told the doctor. I knew how to, I knew how to believe God. I knew how to do my side of the thing. But you know what? My toes healed because God. Okay? I was listening to the word. I was feeding on the word. I was speaking the word. I knew it. But it's God. It was still God. In the end, no matter, I mean, yes, I used my faith. Yes, I was believing God. But it's not, it's not the greatness of Ed. And I'm telling you, the wonderful thing about this is now I use that testimony to inspire others in faith. I used it with Karen. I used it with Gina in the hospital recently. I used it with Karen when Karen was in the hospital. What we went through, and having to stand our ground and believe God to be healed, and you know, and 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 to keep my toe, which I had the whole thing, the toe, the whole toe, and nothing but the toe. It's all there. Okay. Only thing is, on the side, there's a little indention scar, where it just was, you know, it healed up just a little bit. But you know what? Paul wrote and said, "I bury in my body the, the the scars or the marks." Okay. It's a reminder. My toes, the top was real kind of funky at. at for the, for the beginning, when it healed up, it was off at an angle here. That's filled in. It's filled in now. It's, 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 it's basically, when you look at my toe, except for the toenail, because I got ingrown toenails twice as it, actually, as it was healing up, and so they just they, they cut off the sides and, and killed the nail bed so it wouldn't do that, so it wouldn't get you know, infected and stuff. Um, so my, my, that big toe toenail is smaller than the other big toe toenail. You know, it's, it's, it's more narrow. If you're looking at my toenails that close, you're looking too close. <laughs> That's all I got to say. Now, if you're a woman doing it, you shouldn't be looking at my feet like that. And if you're a man doing it, get away. <laughs> all right? Just, just move on down the road, pal. I'm just talking. I mean, I'm being serious here. Yeah, take it on down the road, baby. Amen. Okay? Um, but, you know, that, that reminds me. The event that I went through, that God saw me through. And God brought me out. He gave me His Word. He gave me Dad Hagen as a, as a spiritual father to be able to listen to and to get insight from and to get faith out of his, the messages and out of the Word that He preached. He gave me the assurance that he's, he's at work. And we watched Him work every single day. Every single day, watched him work. He gets all the glory. Yes, I stood in faith. Yes, I did what I was supposed to do. But all that is, is getting myself in position for God to be God. And to do what God does. To him be the glory. And the honor and the praise. This is the faith he dealt to me in the first place. And the faith that was increased to me through his word. So faith cometh by hearing, hearing by the word of God. So what can we say in the end of it all? To God be the glory. To God be the glory. This is what God does. He gives us the faith to believe him with, and then when we use it, he does what he does. Amen. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. And we're going we're gonna to stop right there, and um, I'm going to mark pre-prayer, and then we're going to mark there. That's where we'll be next week. All righty? Praise the Lord. All right. Joe, Joe's got the offering bucket here. So if, we're, you know, if you need an offering bucket, <laughs> offering bucket. Well, if you've need, if you got that much money to bring, go ahead and get the bucket. Um, if you need an offering envelope, Joe will help you out. If you're sending electronically, send it. Now, be reminded. And if you all will, will contact people in the church, everybody that you can, and if, you, if we double up, that's fine. The banquet service will start at 5 o'clock on Saturday night. Okay? Now, I know for some people that's, that's an extra hour early, but for some people that might be better because they don't want to come out at 6 and come on out at 5. Get, in, get involved, we'll get it set up, and then we'll get in there, we'll have a whole thing, and then we'll close up and get out of here. We've invited Marvin, he's going to be here tonight, so we invited him to join the banquet. Um, and come on over and eat with us and so forth. And, but 5 o'clock Saturday, 8 o'clock, 
So anybody in the envelope, raise your hand. Okay, we're good. Um, so those that are going to be raise your, you know, not raise your hand. Those will be here, bring your offerings for, for your Sunday morning offering on Saturday night, and um, so forth. Let people know if they're if they're if they're coming. If they're not coming Saturday, and we're not going to have church on Sunday. Uh, they can they can send it um, to the church PO box. We'll go get it. Hallelujah. Instead of waiting another week, two weeks, three weeks. I mean, we've got, we got two more Sundays before Christmas. Okay, this coming Sunday and the following Sunday, and then that next Sunday, Christmas Sunday, we're not having church on that Sunday. Okay? Center's closed, and we're not going to have service. Okay? Well, that, next, that next service after that will be on that New Year's weekend. New Year's is on the Wednesday, Tuesday, or whatever, so that, but that weekend prior, prior to that, we'll be back in here on the 20, 29th, I think it is. Is it the 30th? First is on Tuesday. Monday is the 31st. So on the 30th, we'll be back in here on the 30th. Um, so this week, next week, the 15th, 16th. I got, I, I, I got so much stuff going on, on on the Saturdays through this month that I keep trying to call Sundays the Saturday days. All right. Praise the Lord. All right. Well, everybody be blessed. And uh, Jesus, name, if you're giving electronically, you can go ahead and ring that up and send it our way. Praise the Lord. And uh, we love you. God bless you. Until we meet again, the Lord be, be good to you. We'll be here Saturday night um, for our, our preaching part of the service. You don't get to watch a seat. I'm sorry. Um, we're not doing virtual food. Okay? That's not right. It'll make you suffer and not get in on the deal like that. Yeah. Glory. Amen? All right. We love you. God bless you. We'll see you next time here at Faith and Victory Church. Praise the Lord. All right, everybody. Yeah.